Chapter Seven of the Boats of the Glen Carrick, by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jason Mills. The Island in the Weed. It was as we were all discussing the matter of the Devil Face that had peered up at me out of the water that Job, the ordinary seaman, discovered the island in the light of the growing dawn and seeing it sprang to his feet with so loud a cry that we were like for the moment to have thought he had seen a second demon yet when we made the discovery of that which he had already perceived we checked our blame at his sudden shout for the sight of land after so much desolation made us very warm in our hearts now at first the island seemed but a very small matter for we did not know at that time that we viewed it from its end yet despite this we took to our oars and rowed with all haste towards it and so, coming nearer, were able to see that it had a greater size than we had imagined. Presently, having cleared the end of it, and keeping to that side which was further from the great mass of the weed continent, we opened out a bay that curved inward to a sandy beach, most seductive to our tired eyes. Here, for the space of a minute, we paused to survey the prospect, and I saw that the island was of a very strange shape, having a great hump of black rock at either end, and dipping down into a steep valley between them. In this valley there seemed to be a deal of a strange vegetation that had the appearance of mighty toadstools, and down nearer the beach there was a thick grove of a kind of very tall reed, and these we discovered afterwards to be exceeding tough and light, having something of the qualities of the bamboo. Regarding the beach, it might have been most reasonably supposed that it would be very thick with the driftweed, but this was not so, at least not at that time though a projecting horn of the black rock which ran out into the sea from the upper end of the island was thick with it. And now, the boatswain having assured himself that there was no appearance of any danger, we bent to our oars, and presently had the boat aground upon the beach, and here, finding it convenient, we made our breakfast. During this meal, the boatswain discussed with us the most proper thing to do, and it was decided to push the boat off from the shore, leaving Job in her, whilst the remainder of us made some exploration of the island. And so, having made an end of eating, we proceeded as we had determined, leaving Job in the boat, ready to scull ashore for us if we were pursued by any savage creature, while the rest of us made our way towards the nearer hump, from which, as it stood some hundred feet above the sea, we hoped to get a very good idea of the remainder of the island. First, however, the boatswain handed out to us the two cutlasses and the cut and thrust, the other two cutlasses being in Josh's boat, and taking one himself, he passed me the cut and thrust, and gave the other cutlass to the biggest of the men. Then he bade the others to keep their sheath knives handy, and was proceeding to lead the way, when one of them called out to us to wait a moment, and with that ran quickly to the clump of reeds. Here he took one with both his hands and bent upon it, but it would not break, so that he had to notch it about with his knife, and thus in a little he had it clear. After this he cut off the upper part, which was too thin and lissom for his purpose, and then thrust the handle of his knife into the end of the portion which he had retained, and in this wise he had a most serviceable lance or spear, for the reeds were very strong, and hollow after the fashion of bamboo, and when he had bound some yarn about the end into which he had thrust his knife, so as to prevent it splitting, it was a fit enough weapon for any man. Now the boatswain, perceiving the happiness of the fellow's idea, bade the rest make to themselves similar weapons, and whilst they were busy thus, he commended the man very warmly. And so in a little, being now most comfortably armed, we made inland towards the nearer black hill, in very good spirits. Presently we were come to the rock which formed the hill, and found that it came up out of the sand with great abruptness, so that we could not climb it on the seaward side. At that the boatswain led us round a space towards that side where lay the valley, and here there was underfoot neither sand nor rock, but ground of a strange and spongy texture. And then, suddenly, rounding a jutting spur of the rock, we came upon the first of the vegetation, an incredible mushroom, nay, I should say toadstool, for it had no healthy look about it, and gave out a heavy, mouldy odour. And now we perceived that the valley was filled with them, all that is save a great circular patch, where nothing appeared to be growing, though we were not yet at a sufficient height to ascertain the reason of this. Presently we came to a place where the rock was split by a great fissure running up to the top, and showing many ledges and convenient shelves upon which we might obtain hold and footing and so we set to about climbing helping one another so far as we had ability until in about the space of some ten minutes we reached the top and from thence had a very fine view 
we perceived now that there was a beach upon that side of the island which was opposed to the weed, though, unlike that upon which we had landed, it was greatly choked with weed, which had drifted ashore. After that, I gave notice to see what space of water lay between the island and the edge of the great weed continent, and guessed it to be no more than maybe some ninety yards, at which I fell to wishing that it had been greater, for I was grown much in awe of the weed, and the strange things which I conceived it to contain. Abruptly, the boatswain clapped me upon the shoulder, and pointed to some object that lay out in the weed, at a distance of not much less than the half of a mile from where we stood. Now, at first, I could not conceive what manner of thing it was at which I stared, until the boatswain, remarking my bewilderment, informed me that it was a vessel, all covered in, no doubt as a protection against the devilfish and other strange creatures in the weed. And now I began to trace the hull of her, amid all that hideous growth, but of her masts I could discern nothing, and I doubted not but that they had been carried away by some storm ere she was caught by the weed, and then the thought came to me of the end of those who had built up that protection against the horrors which the weed world held hidden amid its slime. Presently I turned my gaze once more upon the island, which was very plain to see from where we stood. I conceived, now that I could see so much of it, that its length would be near to half a mile, though its breadth was something under four hundred yards, thus it was very long in proportion to its width. In the middle part it had less breadth than at the ends, being perhaps three hundred yards at its narrowest, and a hundred yards wider at its broadest. Upon both sides of the island, as I have made already a mention, there was a beach, though this extended to no great distance along the shore, the remainder being composed of the black rock of which the hills were formed. And now, having a closer regard to the beach upon the weed side of the island, I discovered amid the rack that had been cast ashore a portion of the lower mast and topmast of some great ship, with rigging attached, but the yards were all gone. This find I pointed out to the boatswain, remarking that it might prove of use for firing. But he smiled at me, telling me that the dried weed would make a very abundant fire, and this without going to the labour of cutting the mast into suitable logs. And now he, in turn, called my attention to the place where the huge fungi had come to a stop in their growing, and I saw that in the centre of the valley there was a great circular opening in the earth, like the mouth of a prodigious pit, and it appeared to be filled to within a few feet of the mouth with water, over which spread a brown and horrid scum. Now, as may be supposed, I stared with some intentness at this, for it had the look of having been made with labour, being very symmetrical, yet I could not conceive but that I was deluded by the distance, and that it would have a rougher appearance when viewed from a nearer standpoint. From contemplating this, I looked down upon the little bay in which our boat floated. Job was sitting in the stern, sculling gently with the steering oar, and watching us. At that I waved my hand to him in friendly fashion, and he waved back. And then, even as I looked, I saw something in the water under the boat, something dark-coloured that was all of a move. The boat appeared to be floating over it, as over a mass of sunk weed, and then I saw that, whatever it was, it was rising to the surface. At this a sudden horror came over me, and I clutched the boatswain by the arm and pointed, crying out that there was something under the boat. Now the boatswain, so soon as he saw the thing, ran forward to the brow of the hill, and placing his hands to his mouth after the fashion of a trumpet, sang out to the boy to bring the boat to the shore, and make fast the painter to a large piece of rock. At the boatswain's hail, the lad called out, Ay, ay! and standing up gave a sweep with his oar that brought the boat's head round towards the beach. Fortunately for him, he was no more than some thirty yards from the shore at this time, else he had never come to it in his life, for the next moment the moving brown mass beneath the boat shot out a great tentacle, and the oar was torn out of Job's hands, with such power as to throw him right over onto the starboard gunwale of the boat. The oar itself was drawn out of sight, and for the minute the boat was left untouched. Now the boatswain cried out to the boy to take another oar, and get ashore while still he had chance, and at that we all called out various things, one advising one thing and another recommending some other, Yet our advice was vain, for the boy moved not, of which some cried that he was stunned. I looked now to where the brown thing had been, for the boat had moved a few fathoms from the spot, having got some way upon her before the oar was snatched, and thus I discovered that the monster had disappeared, having, I conceived, sunk again into the depths from which it had risen. Yet it might reappear at any moment, and in that case the boy would be taken before our eyes. At this juncture the boatswain called to us to follow him, and led the way to the great fissure up which we had climbed, and so, in a minute, we were, each of us, scrambling down with what haste we could make towards the valley, and all the while, as I dropped from ledge to ledge, I was full of torment to know whether the monster had returned. 
The bosun was the first man to reach the bottom of the cleft, and he set off immediately round the base of the rock to the beach, the rest of us following him as we made safe our footing in the valley. I was the third man down, but being light and fleet of foot, I passed the second man, and caught up with the bosun just as he came upon the sand. Here I found that the boat was within some five fathoms of the beach, and I could see Job still lying insensible, but of the monster there was no sign. And so matters were, the boat nearly a dozen yards from the shore, and Job lying insensible in her, with somewhere near under her keel, for all that we knew, a great monster, and we helpless upon the beach. Now I could not imagine how to save the lad, and indeed I fear he hath been left to destruction, for I had deemed it madness to try to reach the boat by swimming. But for the extraordinary bravery of the boatswain, who, without hesitating, dashed into the water, and swam boldly out to the boat, which, by the grace of God, he reached without mishap, and climbed in over the bows. Immediately he took the painter, and hove it to us, bidding us tail on it and bring the boat to shore without delay. And by this method of gaining the beach he showed wisdom, for in this wise he escaped attracting the attention of the monster by unneedful stirring of the water, as he would surely have done had he made use of an oar. Yet despite his care, we had not finished with the creature, for just as the boat grounded, I saw the lost steering oar shoot up half its length out of the sea, and immediately there was a mighty splather in the water astern, and the next instant the air seemed full of huge, whirling arms. At that the boatswain gave one look behind, and, seeing the thing upon him, snatched the boy into his arms, and sprang over the bows onto the sand. Now, at sight of the devilfish, we had all made for the back of the beach at a run, none troubling even to retain the painter, and because of this we were like to have lost the boat, for the great cuttlefish had its arms all splayed about it, seeming to have a mind to drag it down into the deep water from whence it had risen, and it had possibly succeeded, but that the boatswain brought us all to our senses, for having laid Job out of harm's way, he was the first to seize the painter, which lay trailed upon the sand, and at that we got back our courage, and ran to assist him. Now there happened to be convenient a great spike of rock, the same, indeed, to which the boatswain had bidden Job tie the boat, and to this we ran the painter, taking a couple of turns about it, and two half-hitches, and now, unless the rope carried away, we had no reason to fear the loss of the boat, though there seemed to us to be a danger of the creatures crushing it. Because of this, and because of a feeling of natural anger against the thing, the boatswain took up from the sand one of the spears which had been cast down when we hauled the boat ashore. With this he went down so far as seemed safe, and prodded the creature in one of its tentacles the weapon entering easily, at which I was surprised, for I had understood that these monsters were near to invulnerable, in all parts save their eyes. At receiving this stab, the great fish appeared to feel no hurt, for it showed no signs of pain, and at that the boatswain was further emboldened to go nearer, so that he might deliver a more deadly wound. Yet scarce had he taken two steps before the hideous thing was upon him, and but for an agility wonderful in so great a man, he had been destroyed. Yet, spite of so narrow an escape from death, he was not the less determined to wound or destroy the creature, and to this end he dispatched some of us to the grove of reeds, to get half a dozen of the strongest, and when we returned with these, he bade two of the men lash their spears securely to them, and by this means they had now spears of a length of between thirty and forty feet. With these it was possible to attack the devilfish without coming within reach of its tentacles, and now being ready, he took one of the spears, telling the biggest of the men to take the other. Then he directed him to aim for the right eye of the huge fish, whilst he would attack the left. Now, since the creature had so nearly captured the boatswain, it had ceased to tug at the boat, and lay silent, with its tentacles spread all about it, and its great eyes appearing just over the stern, so that it presented an appearance of watching our movements, though I doubt if it saw us with any clearness, for it must have been dazed with the brightness of the sunshine. And now the boatswain gave the signal to attack, at which he and the man ran down upon the creature with their lances, as it were in rest. The boatswain's spear took the monster truly in its left eye, but the one wielded by the man was too bendable, and sagged so much that it struck the stern-post of the boat, the knife-blade snapping off short. Yet it mattered not, for the wound inflicted by the boatswain's weapon was so frightful that the giant cuttlefish released the boat, and slid back into deep water, churning it into foam and gouting blood. For some minutes we waited to make sure that the monster had indeed gone, and after that we hastened to the boat, and drew her up so far as we were able, after which we unloaded the heaviest of her contents, and so were able to get her right clear of the water. And for an hour afterwards the sea all about the little beach was stained black, and in places red. End of chapter 7